Welcome back, everyone, to Jeremiah with New Covenant. We're in Matthew 22. We greet you in the only name given amongst men. We're in Matthew 22, Luke 14, reference to the big party. And uh, you don't want to miss the party. Pretty soon, there's only going to be one party. Now, I was over Pastor Tom's house watching basketball here the other day, and, and they kept having commercials with parties. Party over here, drinking, party over there, and it, and here's the issue. Pretty soon there's only going to be one party in the entire heaven and earth. I was going to say universe, but there, there's no such thing as a universe. When the Bible says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, that's all there is. There's nothing else. Unless you have a wild imagination, like Einstein said, imagination is everything. Which sounds idiotic. Imagination is not everything. Reality is everything. Before you get, before you become imaginative, you need to find reality first. That goes for Einstein too. Or maybe even Tesla. I don't care who it is. It's, you know, you, we have reality right here in red letters. I don't need to look for reality. And as far as imagination goes, I don't want any imagination that contradicts uh, the simple fourth grade grammar in here. That means that Einstein and a little bit of Tesla and a little bit of this guy and a little bit of that guy, uh, they are all basically mentally retarded on many levels. Because the Bible's been right there in front of them. Einstein had the Bible right in his face. Now, if he rejects the simple science in there, that makes him mentally retarded. These Bibles are, are, are in every hotel in America. He must have seen a Bible somewhere. And for him to reject the simple science in this Bible and then go, go cold cock with NASA on a bunch of nonsense, lies, and confusion is makes them idiotas. That's the that's the bottom line. It kind of reminds me of the of the story of a of a student who got a straight A's in school and he walked out to the red light and when he, when school was over and he tried to run across the red light and he got hit. So all, all of the academics were just a waste of time. Because academics are supposed to help you. They're supposed to take you to reality. They're supposed to root you in what you need. Einstein needs to be a forgiven and to be a Christian. That's what he needs. Not to extrapolate on black holes, which don't even exist. So, so, so that's the point. Ooh-wee, out there, out there somewhere, you know, woo-hoo. So Einstein is essentially the student who got straight A's, and when, and when the red light came, he ran across the street, and he got hit. Psychologically, that's what happened to him, but it's common sense. Why? Because he keeps contradicting the simple principles in here that are very simple to read. I just went through some more science. Uh, uh, I have some more science available for my heaven and earth lesson now. There's Ezra, I, I, I skipped the scriptures in Ezra pertaining to water above you and God, God separated the waters. So uh, I, I have more science coming. So I'm very happy with this new science and and uh, and and because I'm basically done with heaven and earth. And, and, and science. I spent a lot of years studying it, and there's not much more left, and, and the book is basically closed. However, I just found some more supplements uh, to really hammer home even further uh, um, the same idea, though, which is there's a vault on top of you and so forth, all that. Okay. Sure, my, we just listened to 22. Let's get into it. And uh, I want to make a point and park right there for a while that we need an emotional beautification here, is my point. You, you have an opportunity as a Christian to read these words and stop and think about them, is my point. John 14 is probably the best place. Here's another good place here. The Father made a banquet for the Son. Okay, this banquet is not without emotion. That's my point. 
It sounds unemotional when you read it, but that's because Father God is being very businesslike about this love union. That's what he's doing. He's being very businesslike about this. When you go to John 14, it's the same thing. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. Does that sound very syrupy to you? Give me 20 hugs? No. I go to make a place for you so I can be with you and receive you unto myself without any emotional fanfare. I want you to be with me. That's basically all I have to say. If you love me, you'll do what I tell you to do. That's how the master's talking. And, 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 I, and I understand that. Um, let me share something with you. My parents talk the same way the master did. Or does. He's speaking to us now. These are living words. The point is, is that my parents were very much like the master. Not a lot of talk, a lot of action. <laughs> That's, and, and, and having been through a life with my parents, and some of you the same thing. That's why I'm mentioning this, because we, we're, we're sharing. I'm not giving something super personal here. It, it, what I'm saying is that, is that it, it was an interesting experience because, in retrospect, I really enjoyed don't tell me, show me. That's what I really enjoyed. Both of my parents were, were very much alike. They, they said they were different, but they weren't. <laughs> they, they, you know, they, and I think it just everybody wants to be an individual, you know. I want chocolate ice cream and, and you want vanilla and, and I like that, you know, but it's still ice cream. And the point is is that Let's get the fan off. I don't want all the noise here. But the point is that my parents didn't do a lot of talking. You know, they were there, and, and, and that was what, was what was desired. I met people in my life, and I've seen them. They brag about loving people, their families, and so forth. And, and, and you'll see, it's on television, too. I love my cat, my dog, my Subaru. Well, do they really love the Subaru? You know, I, I love my son, you know, oh, I really do, I really do. Oh, my goodness, I really do. Oh, I love him, oh, I love him. But you, you haven't seen him in 20 years or something. In other words, talk doesn't mean anything, really. Uh, people flapping their jaws. It's chin music, and it's everywhere. Chin music. You just keep talking, and you're not really doing anything. I've known people that say, oh, I love my parents or whatever, and, and all they do is really, is really shame their parents by, by, by constantly drinking and, and, and making them uh, nervous by hanging around the wrong people in the hood and stuff. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that I'm perfect as far as... Uh, uh, you know, being a good kid or a good adult, uh, per se. No, that's not my point here. My point is, is that when you, when, you, when you talk about something, you got to back it up. And the best thing to do is really don't talk about it that much at all. That's what I've learned. Just don't talk about it that much. I don't mind you talking about it. I love poetry. Uh, um, I like Bible. I love Bible poetry. I like poetry. I have lots of movies with poetry. Uh, Cyrano de Bergerac is excellent poetry. He won an Oscar here in the United States. That's one year America got it right. America gets it right every now and then. They, they do a good job here in America, oh, about 20, 30% of the time. And that's better down in Chile, where, 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 they, where they kill each other, and they get it right 1% of the time. So, you know, we, we can criticize America all you want to, but, uh, because, it's, because they deserve criticism. Everybody does, but uh, it, it's a lot better than somewhere else. And when you, when you compare, let's put it that way. 
But no, listen. Uh, it's okay to listen to a lot of beautiful talk and conversation. But the bottom line is, is show me is better than talk about it. I, I would say that ideally, for you to show me and talk about it is best. But my parents, and maybe some of you out there, you, you, you've had parents that did, they didn't really talk that much. But you would never question their devotion to you. Because it, it, the bottom line is you don't need a lot of talk. That's the key. You don't need it. There, there's no requirement for it. What you need is somebody who's there and reliable and caring and works hard and stuff. That's what you needed more than anything else. A lot of talk and, and, and no action, that, that doesn't benefit you at all. And, and the master here, we were looking 14 here. And let's get back to Matthew 22. Uh, you know, uh, uh, my father's house has many mansions. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Once again, the master has absolutely perfect grammar. I've never seen anybody write as pure and clean as the master. Nobody. I've read, I've read hundreds of books in my life. I used to hang out to downtown library in Los Angeles, one of the biggest libraries in the world. And, and I never read anything like this. And you never will. Now, how much should, should we supplement these love messages, such as I, 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 I'm giving a banquet for my son, and the people who love him are basically coming to the banquet. And that's what I want to start this whole lesson out with. And I want to hammer that home, because you, you can get lost here a little bit. This is a very emotional experience there, with this rapture and then this banquet. Obviously, the banquet's going to be probably during right after the rapture. That's the only time it can happen, as far as my uh, timeline goes. Now, I've already added Song of Solomon to this, because we want to keep our minds on beauty here big time. We really want to keep our minds alerted to beauty and emotional experiences with this Bible, and that's what makes Mr. David monstrous. That's what makes Mr. King David uh, the man. I mean, it, this guy's an amazing guy, this, this Mr. David, because he gives you a lot of truth, but he puts a lot of emotion into it, and it makes him the greatest writer in the history of mankind. There's nobody in that guy's category. His son does a pretty good job here in Song of Solomon, so he must run in the family, but uh, he, uh, David is, he is Mr. Mr. Amazing. We're not worshiping him. We're just saying that his love for God and his ability to write and using God's skills he gave him to write he is the man. It's in any, if it were a horse race, he would win by 100 yards. I mean, I mean, because he takes everything in Christianity and he puts boots on the ground and he puts a lot of emotion into it so that you are really catapulted out of this, you know, out of this realm here. You know, you're, you're, uh, you're flying, you know, you're, you know, we, in, in love, in my love, in my love playlist here, we have uh, fly. I put fly in there. Soar in the sky, like a circus ride forever. And the person who really takes you to these heights is Mr. David.
he validates what Christianity really is because of his emotion and sincerity and his poetry. The master is matter of fact. The master and the father, the way they speak in these, in these scriptures, these red letters, is I go to make a place for you because I want you to be with me. If you love me, you will do this. I think it's very interesting that the father decided to speak in that manner. And, and I can appreciate that very simple, I, 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 I want you to be with me and let it go. I, I like that. There's no, there's no room for maybe there. There's no room for, I, I, I'm too emotional and I might get confused. You know, it's just, I am going to do this done. And, 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 and let's go back to the John 14. I want to go to Solomon for a moment to get back into this emotional aspect of what we're reading here. Because I, I want to talk about some emotion before we get into this. And I didn't plan on doing this, but I, I, I decided to do this. It's the, same, it's the same thing as when we go to John 14, 31. Let's get some light on this. I'm going to lose it. But that the world may know that I love the Father. Does that sound gooey to you at all? No, it's not. It's, not. it's straightforward. We own it. We've got it, and there's nothing else to say. And, and as I mentioned before, that's the way my parents kind of talked. Let's, let, let, let's finish. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father has commanded me. In other words, I love the Father... And he gave me a commandment. In other words, as I love him, he gave me something to do. Now, being in a human body and being the son of man from Mary, he can take commandments from the Father. But he can't take commandments from the Father per se as the Son of God because he's two people. But he's referring to the Son of Man right now. Because God is his Father as a human also. And as a human, he's being told to take his human body and to suffer in that body. And that's the commandment that the Father gave him. And then he says, even so I do. That is absolute precision grammar right there. You can't say that any shorter. The Lord Jesus Christ knows how to speak grammar, English in this case, so precise and so powerful that it's amazing. He only said a few words, but he said a thousand words. He's showing his love to Father just as we show our love to Father by laying down our lives for the benefit of others. The essence of Christianity. And even so I do. So it is the, the highest love of any love there is, and yet there's very little talk about it. And, 
and, and I think it's wonderful. I, and and what's, what's amazing about this to me, let me share it with you. What's, what's our time? What's amazing about this to me is, is when you experience that love, It's obviously more emotional than what you're reading here. That's what's excuse me, that's what's important. This is a very emotional love here. Yet it appears to be some sort of robotic love. But that's when you're reading it wrong. Because you're a human being and you're used to people overdoing it. That's, that's the point here. People who are really sincere with you, they don't do a lot of talking in general. I swear I'll do it, Billy. I really swear, man. Yeah, you know, that person's probably playing games. Just say you're going to do it. That's all that's required here. All this emotional baggage and whatever, we really don't need it. Now, I want to go to Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, because I, I want you to understand that, that we're not getting lost on beauty here. Um, and this is the grandfather of the person we just, been, we, we, we just quoted. This is a family affair here. When, when you go to the Master and then Solomon and David, it, it's a family affair. And you have the most intelligent, caring people in the history of the world. And that's why we spend every day on this. By the way, some of you might ask me, you know, what else do you do, uh, you know, whatever. Well, I just told you that I, I enjoyed Cyrano de Bergerac. It doesn't mean that, 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 that the play is perfect, but it, 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 whoever did it did a very good job. There's, there's a lot in that play about manhood. The word manhood is used in the play. There's too much about romance, and there are cousins who might get married, which is out of bounds, and there's uh, um, uh, uh, Cyrano pretends to be somebody he isn't to help somebody else uh, with, 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 with his romance and, and, and his uh, matrimonial situation, and I don't agree with that. But other than that, there's no real very serious uh, error, so that I can't recommend that movie in general. So. But uh, or that or the or the play or the book, whatever form you get it in, okay? Because there's a lot of verbiage and maybe excess, you might say, uh, on on the same subject. You know what I mean? That's, let's go to Song of Solomon. I want to point something out to you. Let's go to I want to go to Let's, let's make a few quotes that I mentioned in beauty last year. I need to change my glasses here. Hold on. It's very important that we make sure that we keep our beauty lesson as a big cornerstone here in Christianity, that we could add some emotion here. And, and I'm not contradicting myself. It's just that um, uh, I learned that you don't need to run your mouth, as they say in America here, about something. Just do it. You know, 
that's why they have a lot of songs in America like "Hold Me," you know. But that'll that'll that'll, that'll answer the question, you know. If you if you if you hold me, that means you probably love me. That's the point. You never have to say anything. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite songs is called "Hold Me." Who was that? Mr. Carter. That, that was a platinum a platinum love song here in America. Hold me. Beautiful song. We're here to talk about that a little bit here. And, and let, let's get into that a little bit. Uh, before we get into 22, this is going to take longer than I planned because, because we're just about done with Matthew and I'm going to breeze through uh, Mark. So we're going to catch up. We're going to catch up with my time schedule here. And, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm very happy with Corinthians, by the way, as we Get ready for this. I'm very happy with Corinthians, uh, the way it's coming out. I've also decided to probably skip um, Isaiah 1, which is, that's where I am also here, and go probably directly to, uh, to chapter 2. I'm not going to have any more reviews. I think I'm going to skip um, Isaiah 1. I'm thinking about it. And come back to that next year. Because Isaiah will be an annual, uh, biannual lesson here. Esther might be something once every five years, but but when it comes to Isaiah, you, you have to go over that twice a year. Uh, Song of Solomon, uh, maybe once a year, but uh, let's get to it. Let's go to let's go to uh, uh, Song of Solomon, chapter eight. Let's go to verse six. Now, th now this book is known for being heavily romantic. And a little bit too much information, especially for young people. However, I'm not going to reference those points, okay? Uh, ro romantic details. We, we don't do that here. We might touch on it just really lightly. So as to make this a an all-ages G-rated uh, Bible lesson, it's available basically for all ages. And this ministry is basically for teenagers and adults. However, young teens who, who want to get into the Bible and listen to uh, some Bible teachers online, you know, there's many of, there's many of us online, uh, you can listen and learn and take advantage of people who've been studying for years, such as Solomon and David and, the, and whoever we listen to here. Some of these gentlemen are young, some of them are old. I don't know how old... Solomon was when he read when he wrote this. Let's go to that. Set me as a seal upon thy heart. As a seal, I'm sorry, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. That's, that's some of the most powerful stuff ever written. And remember, when the Master talks about caring for the sheep under the Good Shepherd Scripture, the, uh, I am the Good Shepherd, my sheep, they hear my voice, and I call them, and they have eternal life, and they shall never die. My Father, who is greater than all, gave them unto me, and no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. And I am the good shepherd who careth for the sheep. He cares for the sheep. He lays, he says, I lay down my life for the sheep. But he doesn't give a lot of details. We have the cross as, as an obvious reference to the depth of love. We, we, we know that. 
But when we have other references, we may as well use them. And here, and here is a monster right here. For love is strong as death. Mr. Solomon is giving you some very significant stuff right there. Jealousy as cruel as the grave. These people around the corner, they worship Mary, animals, whatever. They, 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 I don't know how many things they worship in that building around the corner here. And God says he's a jealous God. So you think if you can pray. I have a movie with a lady, she's a nun, of, of course. And she, she, goes, she says, oh, I'm married to Jesus Christ in the movie. And, and then she kneels down before Mary or something. And, and we're watching the movie and I'm thinking to myself, this is how bad America got where they started tolerating this uh, um, uh, abomination. And, and a lot of these movie writers and screenwriters, they know they're doing something that's an abomination. God says, I'm a jealous God in the second commandment there. And, and, it, it, and all of this, it, it, it's just amazing to me that that... So many people, and you might point this out to them, and I, and I pointed this out to quite a few Catholics, and I said, what do you think God thinks about you kneeling to somebody else and calling them God? Don't you know the number one uh, crime in the Old Testament was what you're doing? Well, I don't know that, and, and I, I, we're doing the right thing, and there's nothing wrong with it. They're very nice people, and all of this. And, and, you, and, you, and a lot of these people, and I'm here to help them. I, I just gave a new Catholic lesson. That's 53A in this ministry now. I, I decided to really hammer home of this Catholicism nonsense and, and try to try to save some of these people. But here he says, for love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. Millions of people are provoking God to jealousy. And if I read this correctly, and it's very simple, it's very simple grammar, that jealousy is as tough as death is. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which have a most vehement flame. Meaning that the 